basically made some circles and some triangles in. Completely different from this one. And also scrunched up some cellophane to make ice crystal-like shapes, because I told you the ice, alas, is over for the year. And that's the beginning of a new series, because it has different colors. It has a slightly different red. It has a different blue. Yeah, and a different um, yellow. And it's the beginning of a new series. You know, so while it'll end up looking like my work, I know that that's something else. And you know, the desire to make the new series tells you the old one is done. <laughs> it's time to move on. And you know, yeah, it's tricky. That's why you gotta find a medium where you can do what you call additive and subtractive techniques. You can go into the painting and then erase and come out and then go back in without it being, oh no, I have to start all over again. What about the orientation? Decide. When do you decide? Which when do I decide? Yeah. Well, this one, go ahead and turn that one on its side because honestly, it doesn't work. I know I like it on its side. That one has really worked out both ways. I often don't decide the final orientation till later. There are three of those, and I may just make them one horizontal line like that. But because I'm always turning the work as I'm working, I really want it to work from each end, from each side. Because, yeah, this is something that I was taught. I was taught that when you're looking at a painting, what you're looking at is what is, how does the painting relate to the space? Where does it exit the space of the painting? And that's where I don't want that framing element we were talking about. Um, but also, uh, where do you want the weight of the painting to be? At some point you have to decide, okay? Um, a lot of people like it when they're looking at a painting like this and the heavy stuff, if you put the heavy stuff on top, it has a sense that it's floating up, right? If you put it on the bottom, can I just do what I'm doing? Okay. If you put it on the bottom, you're starting to get into a landscape already, right? A heavier bottom with um, a more open sky, okay? So until I decide what I want to do, I keep turning it. Yeah, excuse me for one second. Uh, at the very end, yes, I will sign it, but not till later. <laughs> And sometimes on the back, I will put a little arrow. So, well, also to show that you can do whatever you want. Um, I will do something like this. This is something you can do for your people, your customers. You just make an arrow that goes like this and one that goes like that. And that way you're indicating that I don't mind. Yeah. But if you're wiring it, that's trickier. That's true. You know, because that's why. But also if you signed it. Right. You can't. Well, I don't necessarily sign it in a horizontal line. <laughs> so, right, so okay. yeah. On that painting over there that you were looking at, we were talking about the, that I'm freezing media um, and creating. Can you can you point to him where the ice crystals are? Oh, There's some on the sides there. Um, I take them out at night, and under certain conditions, ice crystals form on the surface of the clayboard. They are absorbed by the clayboard. Right in here. All of that sort of fern like pattern. Yeah. And um, we've also been talking about painting with paper because of the way that I use the paper. And I layer it to create um, colors. For example, a white over a red is going to make a pink, and there's the pink coming through. Um, in the landscapes, I might create a brown or a neutral color by layering it on purpose. So in that case, it was an orangey color on top of uh, a darker green. And all of the paper is made from tree fiber. It's made from banana, mango, and mulberry tree fiber. Handmade acid-free paper from Japan and Thailand and Nepal. Uh, for the most part, the paper is translucent and allows for all of that layering. But I've also incorporated some more uh, opaque papers for contrast. And all I need to do with the paper is use the acrylic mediums that I'm using. I'm using polymer medium gloss today. And just we're just talking. And as we're talking, I'm demonstrating different things that the paper does. Um, so for example, I would, let's say I wanted to layer this on top of the gold. Now you can see already uh, some of the color coming through from before. You can't see it when it's wet, but I know. And I was saying that part of the fun with the paper is to go in and just pull it apart and rip it. I, I don't use any scissors at all. I'm trying to use the paper 
the most sort of natural, organic way. And you've also said, when it's dry, lighter or dark? The, the translucent paper becomes more translucent because when it's wet, remember, we couldn't see, you know, as much through there. Where it clumps, the color remains more or less the same. Yeah, I mean, this color is not going to change that much. It looks darker now because it's wet. When it's dry, it's more the color that it is. It returns. And um, here I was talking about actually picking up the different shapes inside the fiber and using those shapes to continue a line. That's why I was talking about painting. That's another aspect of the painting with paper. If you were going to pick up some paint, let's say, and say, oh, I want to have some yellow line intersect here and do that, I'm just doing it with the paper. And within, see how the fibers are starting to show through? Mm -hmm. Later, it's never going to be totally white, but it'll be a lighter yellow than where it overlaps. How did you choose to put those pieces of paper there? Just Right now, I'm just doing it just, yeah, as uh, just as but demonstration, but I am keeping in mind that um, there are certain parts of the painting that I want to be lighter than other parts. Mm -hmm. There are certain parts of the painting that I want to send back in space. So imagine that, um, and I, I would do that by adding um, lighter tones over darker ones. So here, for example, we have a very dense area, and if I bring in this paper, these white spots are actually going to show through the green later. It'll be a lighter green. And so then suddenly, part of this is going to move away from you, and part of it's going to move toward you. Before, they were all kind of at the same level. See what I mean by that? And, you know, maybe I don't like that shape, so that's where I might start to play with it a little more, or layer on top of it. But the kind of very pale green that's going to make underneath it's going to be really beautiful. I was saying a little earlier that I've brought paper as if I've brought paint. So I've brought a, some blue paper, I've brought some yellow paper, I've brought some reddish paper, and I use those just to create whatever colors and neutrals that I need for the painting. These are at the beginning. That's why I purposely brought them unfinished. These are more completed works, and you can see I do landscapes and abstracts. How long does it take, like, for this? How long did it take? A painting like that takes quite a bit of time because there's probably 12 or 15 layers in there, beginning with the paint and going all the way through the top, so uh, it's hard to say. Months? 40 hours? No, not months. I'm speedy. <laughs> but, um, no, uh, but quite a bit of time. I mean, this is not something that you can pull off in a couple hours. Uh, you have to revisit it and revisit it. Um, certain parts of it don't take very much time at all. Staining takes no time. To pour the water under the right conditions to get the crystals is almost instantaneous, but the conversation I have with the painting later can last many, many hours.